All right, I guess we'll get kicked off. So hi everyone, uh, welcome to Zeke from Home. Uh, I am Phil Ljewski from Ribbon Security. And uh, on the call with me, I have a couple of colleagues. We have Javier, who's our head of product, and Steve McCann, who's our, our CEO. Uh, so uh, we're gonna walk through a bunch of things today about the, uh, the technology that we've uh, open sourced recently. Actually, let me grab my speaker notes if I may. Come on now. Pardon me. Okay, so uh, this is just a, a list of, of the stuff that we have planned. Uh, you may have seen this in Amber's announcement. Uh, I think we may be a slightly different animal than some of the folks that have presented here in the past. You know, other technologies that have presented like Suricata you know, have been around for a long time and have a, a long history of open source contributions. And so while all, all of our stuff from Brim is open source, our community is very young and most of the community interactions so far have been mostly people just getting to know the app and, and the tools and reporting bugs and making early feature suggestions. So uh, rather than a lot of uh, detailed history, we're gonna spend a fair amount of the time walking you through the key parts of, of the Brim uh, and ZQ tools and describe how they touch on Zeek since that's important to you all. So uh, we'll jump right into it. So in terms of uh, how this all got started, it actually goes way, by, way back, uh, the intersection between uh, our team and, and the, the Zeek community. And so Zeek, as I think you mostly all are aware, was written by Vern Paxson at, at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs in the mid 90s. And uh, as it turned out, uh, Vern was sharing an office with Steve McCann, our, our CEO, who's now the founder of Brim. And at the time, Steve had popularized PCAP through his writing of the lib, lib PCAP and co-authoring TCP dump. And around the same time, Vern had an idea for this network monitoring system that leveraged packet data. And <clears throat> that idea ultimately became Zeek. And so what we're showing here on the right side is an excerpt from Vern's original paper. And it showed how Zeek was, uh, or Bro at the time, was leveraging lib PCAP to get access to all that flow data. And, uh, you know, while TCP dump and PCAP went on to be general networking visibility and troubleshooting tools, we know Zeek uh, has been largely embraced for security, uh, network security use cases. But um, you know, we also know that the events produced by Zeek have a lot of rich detail about traffic, even if it's not a security thing that you're looking to do. And that's one of the things that we sought to, to, to bring, bring out in the, the Brim technology uh, in addition to the classic Zeek use cases. So just here's a, before we get into the tech, here's a look at uh, who we are. And um, uh, I'll, I'll use this as an opportunity to let my colleagues introduce themselves. So yeah, there's, there's 10 of us, uh, like so many others, we're now a virtual team spread around the world uh, in our homes, uh, thanks to the uh, viral conditions. And um, yeah, we've been working on this for a couple of years. There's a bunch of developers and uh, some QA. And uh, so let's see, I've got uh, Javier uh, here is uh, here in the upper left. Uh, our head of product, he's on the call with us. Javier, you want to say a few words? Hello, yes, I'm looking after product. Um, joined Brim uh, in January and uh, excited. Uh, it's very cool technology that combines big data and a lot of potential. And, and also drilling down into SIG that I got to know maybe three years ago only. Um, good morning and thank you for being here. And, uh, and then also Steve McCann, he's on the call. He's, uh, he's at a remote location with a, a tight hotspot, so his video is off. But uh, uh, this is Steve here in the upper right. Steve, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, um, my connection to like Zeke and Vern goes way back, like, like Phil said. Um, I had a lot of fun back in the day before the web existed working on, on the internet in that group with, with, with Vern at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Van Jacobson headed it up. And uh, we were working on TCP dump and kept cutting and pasting code out of TCP dump into other little tools we were playing with that did packet stuff. So I, li I was just like, hey, there should be a little library we can link to. And that became the start of libpcap and the pcap file format and, and Vern used pcap for, for Bro, which is now Zeek. And, and so that was like way long ago. Um, and so it's fun to come back and work on this stuff again. In the meantime, I spent a few years as a professor and then took a leave to start a company during the internet bubble. And then uh, we sold that company. Then I started a company called Riverbed, which uh, that was in 2002. We took public. I was there for 13 years. And, uh, and now I'm doing a new project with, with the team. And a lot of us are from Riverbed and, and other different places. So it's been fun so far. I'll, I'll hand it back 
<laughs> to fill with that. All right. All right. Thanks, Steve. Okay. So uh, let's get into the tech, right? So we've got a couple of open source repos out there. Uh, the big ones are Brim. So in addition to being the name of our little company, it's the name of the desktop application that you can find at the brimsec slash brim on GitHub. Uh, and if you haven't already tried it out, you'll, you should find it has kind of a, a Slackish kind of a feel uh, because it's written in Electron, the same framework that Slack uses. So it's got the characteristics of a web app, but delivered as a uh, feeling like a native desktop app, which is uh, pretty modern, uh, has a nice, nice looking feel to it. And that really provides the user experience for searching and analyzing your Zeek logs at we, what we call as desktop scale, right? So uh, it's, it's not seeking to replace your giant clustered uh, mega index uh, that you put your Zeek logs into by the terabyte today. It's, it's, uh, right now, it's, for instance, a great use case for it is winning a capture the flag event, right? Because it's going to, as we'll see, uh, it's going to give you a lot of richness of the Zeek data. Uh, and a query language and, and visualizations that really help you get a lot out of it. Uh, then behind the app, we have uh, ZQ, which is a uh, bunch of infrastructure tooling that provides the, the guts of what, you know, a lot of what makes Brim great. So it's got the actual searching and analyzing of the logs, that, that actual crunching of the data happens there in the back end. And uh, it also does this making use of a new file format, which we'll show off uh, called Zing which is effectively a, a superset of uh, the, the, Zeek, the Zeek format. It can take, take what's good about Zeek data and go even further with it. So we'll show that off. And, and really how this all glues together is uh, we, we call it a tools-based approach. You know, those of us, uh, I think most here probably come from a, a, a Linuxy, Unixy background, and you all know how pipelines work and how useful it is to be able to chain together what seem like simple little pieces into uh, pipelines and uh, do powerful things with them. And that's kind of how we're working with these projects. As we come up with new ideas, we've been prototyping them in ZQ uh, as command line tools. And then as we validate their use with folks like yourselves, uh, we will, we then take what's good about them and uh, expose the functionality to the Brim app through REST APIs and build user interfaces. And then you can start working with them in the app as well. So uh, we're hoping while the community is young, we're hoping that this approach uh, will encourage folks to, to jump in and play with the tools in ways we may not have envisioned. Okay, so let's describe ZQ. What is ZQ? Uh, so the ZQ repo was opened up uh, actually right after Zeek week in the fall of 2019. Uh, we were at Zeek week. Some of you who were there may have seen us as sponsors. There were flyers on tables and we had a, a booth where we showed a demo. And a lot of the technology that's now in the ZQ and Brim open source projects were shown off at Zeek week 2019, though up until that point, we'd really been thinking we were going to deliver it to users as commercial software. You know, a lot of us came from enterprise software in the past and uh, for better or worse, you know, a lot of us, you go with what you know. And so we thought, yeah, let's kind of, you know, do it all over again with new cool technology. And, uh, but it turns out at Zeek Week, Steve spent a fair amount of time talking to some of the core Zeek developers and users from the community and realized that there would be benefits to opening up uh, what we were doing and building on top of what was great about the, the Zeek file format and, and other things about Zeek and, and just provide uh, something similar to, for Zeek data to like what JQ does for JSON data, right? So a query language, um, that, that makes the most of, of the format. And so uh, with that, I will show it off. Um, just real quick, uh, you know, we, we described it at the time as Zeek cut on steroids. You'll see it, I mean, it can do cutting, but it can do a whole lot more. Um, it's, got, uh, it's got not only the thing that executes your queries, it's got this new query language we've put in, which is simple but powerful. And, uh, and I mentioned the, the, the Zing file format, so, and it's, uh, it's written in Go, um, so it's pretty modern. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at ZQ. And let me get my, pardon me, where did I put my window? Thanks for bearing with me here, folks. And uh, Javier, if you're seeing questions come in, just feel free to interrupt me at any time. <clears throat> sure. Okay, so let's take a look at the ZQ help output, right? So much, any other command line, you can see what it can do. 
Uh, so yeah, we're going to start at the command line because, uh, well, that's what we delivered first. It's a, you know, this is not a pretty GUI like the Brim app. We'll see that soon. Uh, we know you guys as Zeek users can appreciate the power of things you can do at command lines. Uh, so here's what's in the help and uh, some key highlights. You can read a lot of different formats of data with ZQ. So while Zeek is, uh, this is the reference to the Zeek tab separated value, you know, the default format you, you, you get from a, a default Zeek install, um, it can read JSON data. Um, we actually recently just started adding f uh, support for Parquet format data. So that's kind of new and experimental, but, but it's, it is working at least for some of the par Parquet formats. And I mentioned the Zing format which we'll get into. So uh, it can, can read a lot of data. It can open compressed versions, right? So if your Zeek log rotator has gzipped your files, no problem. You don't have to uncompress them. You can just read them with ZQ. Um, and, uh, it, and it auto detects formats. So if for some reason you, uh, so while you can explicitly say what to expect, if you just give it data, it will recognize what it is. And if it isn't any of its supported formats, it'll tell you uh, why it wasn't able to process it as each of the, any of the possible formats. Uh, likewise, on output, you can get your data back out as uh, Zeek TSV. You can get it as JSON. You can get it as uh, user visible looking tables. So let's take a look at actually running some commands. Get started here. So uh, here's a directory full of just standard Zeek tab separated value logs. And let's just look inside of one of them to remind ourselves what we're working with. Right, so like any other Zeek log, you've got your headers at the top with fields and uh, data types and records. So if I say with ZQ, whoops, didn't mean to execute that right away. Uh, I said, okay, so ZQ, I wanna see a Zeek format output uh, that just does what Zeek cut does. I just wanna grab two fields from that log and it gives you exactly what you'd think, it gives you a valid Zeek header and those columns, uh, just like ZCut would have done. All right. Now, let's say, for instance, that uh, I wanted to grab the IP address information. Uh, one of the things that ZQ does as it's reading in data is it, um, is it turns it into this internal format, the Zing format that we'll talk about more, uh, which really just tries to, to restore as much of the richness as possible of the original data format. So for instance, um, you know how in, uh, inside of Zeek scripting, you have the concept of records, right? So you have like ID inside of Zeek scripting starts as a record and it gets flattened by the log writer. Uh, but what we were able to do by just referring to only the, the field name ID of what was a record inside the original data, we actually cut out all, all four of the underlying uh, fields that are part of that record. So that's sort of a convenience for you uh, that hopefully will come in handy. But obviously there's more to do uh, than just cutting. Uh, we mentioned search and analytics, right? So let's search. If I just type a bare search word like this, like cotton candy, I will get all the events. It's a you know, case insensitive uh, search, all the events that had the reference to that, uh, pretty much as you'd expect. And if I chain together a couple of terms, like in this case, a, a number, which uh, in this case from looking at the output we know is a port, you get the Boolean and of the two together much like many other query languages. You can also do named field searches. So if you have uh, a particular UID you're searching for, you just give the field name and value and you get back the data you expected. And in addition to Zeek format output, I mentioned we've got like outputs that are more human readable like tables. And in fact, uh, what I'm going to do here with my table output, I'm going to leverage another cool thing that, uh, that ZQ kind of unlocks from the Zeek data. Uh, you know, as you know, uh, Zeek has rich data types beyond the simple ones you get from, say, JSON, things like the address type. And because that data is right there in the Zeek header, uh, when ZQ is reading it in, it's able to preserve and leverage that information. So the fact that we had address type data in the input means we can now perform an efficient CIDR match on it. And so in this case, I said, I want to find a slash 28 uh, in my search. And indeed, I was able to get records that, uh, that match that. You also can do regular expressions. So much like other languages, you got the little squiggly. And uh, in this case, I'm looking for things that start with, uh, that were end with, in this case, candy, followed by three digits. And so you can get that with regular expressions. 
also in addition to search, there's aggregations. So here's a simple one, right? So if I just say, hey, I wanna count by looking at SMB data, right? So what's the SMB path? If I wanna get a count of how many times each of those paths appeared, uh, you can do that quite simply with a count aggregation function. And of course you can count by multiple fields. So if I want the combination of SMB path and originating IP, I can get that combo. And you can chain your pipelines. So if I took that table and piped it much like bash into a subsequent sort processor and said I want to sort in reverse so that the big counts are on top, you can do that. And you can also do expression type math. So for instance, we have this put processor. And if you know your connection logs, you know you have fields like originating bytes, responding bytes. Well, what if you wanted to know the total sum of those for each record? Uh, that's what the put processor will do. You just give it an expression. And uh, in this case, I'm also going to cut out, just to make it readable, only the relevant, uh, the, the relevant bytes fields as well as the UID. And so now you get a table of uh, you know, total bytes, and it's the sum of those two rascals. A uh, little power user thing, just a little tip for you guys. This doesn't get talked about a lot, but um, you can even, uh, you know, we. We think of this as a data flow language. Uh, you know, you're obviously your, your, your events are flowing left to right through these pipelines, but you can actually fork the data flow if you want to. Uh, so in this case, if I took my, uh, the, the output of my expression, and I here have this, these two things wrapped in parentheses with a semicolon in the middle. And so I've said, hey, I wanna take that, that result and I wanna actually average it and summarize it, or you know, take a sum of it. It gives me a warning to let me know places where uh, there actually weren't any values at all, such as this one but now you actually can get both a sum of all the values as well as an average across the whole thing. More format outputs. Uh, if you wanna see NDJSON, you can do that. That's new line, new line separated JSON, much like, the, uh, much like the, the Zeek JSON streaming output. And once again, you've got the hierarchical <laughs> structure of JSON. Uh, Javier, I think we have a question, right? Yes, yeah. Go so for it. The question is, <clears throat> can you search across multiple log files? The answer is yes. If you want Absolutely. To. Yeah, exactly. So for instance, if I just say count by path uh, uh, and say star, oops, let me just put it in a table. It will process all the logs in the directory and give me a single table across all of them. It takes a few seconds because there's a lot of them there. Yep. All right, and then finally, let me close on, let's, I've been mentioning Zing here and there, so let me, uh, uh, oh, actually, one more thing before I get to, to Zing. I, I showed you NDJSON, right? Uh, yeah, we saw NDJSON. Now, uh, we mentioned this tools-based approach, right? So one of the things that this leverage, this can uh, unlock for you is, all right, so let's say I've, I've made a new line separated uh, JSON. Maybe you're a, a JQ ninja, right? So if you want to do things in familiar JQ, you can just pipe the output of ZQ uh, out, to your, out to a JQ uh, command line. And now you can do whatever you want to uh, in JQ as well. Obviously we hope that uh, over time you'll find enough of the processors in, in ZQ can do what you need and you don't need to use JQ as much. But for now, uh, if you're familiar with JQ, you've got it uh, available to you. Uh, do we have another question, Javier? We don't. Okay, sorry, I saw the, the red thing light up, so I just want to make sure. It's Sheldon um, saying nice, and that he didn't want to disturb your flow, but I'm saying <laughs> it's great, thanks. No, no I, I appreciate the, yeah, I like to keep things lively. I, I know you guys are listening, I appreciate it. All right, so I've mentioned Zing a couple of times, or uh, yeah, Zing, so let's, let's show you um, what Zing is, and I'll, uh, then I'll move to uh, ask Steve to talk about it a little more. Um, so here, if I ask for this, this is the text-based output of uh, representation of Zing. If I say I want to look at all the files in this directory as, as text-based Zing, here's what they look like. It's kind of going to be reminiscent of Zeek tab, tab separated uh, value, except that it's more compact and it's a bit more modern. Uh, so all these lines that begin with hashes and numbers represent uh, sort of something similar to those first eight lines you see in a Zeek TSV log. So you've got uh, the field names and types, field names and types, and the types that we have in Zing are sort of modern equivalents in some cases. So for instance, instead of count, we have uint64. Um, but ultimately it gets into the same place, which is you, you find a schema of uh, names and types, and then you refer to the schema by number, and then just give the values 
Uh, so this is pretty compact. Another thing that's great about it is that it's streamable. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, and, and the schema is right there in the data, just like Zeek TSV. And it, it, because it is a superset of, uh, of Zeek TSV and, uh, J and JSON from a functionality perspective, it's a good uh, format for internally um, representing what goes on inside of uh, ZQ. And so that was the text-based representation. Uh, if you wanted to see the binary version, which is sort of the, the default output of ZQ just for efficiency, compactness, and so forth, I mean, that's what binary uh, Zing looks like. Uh, it's not compressed currently, uh, but we have plans to make it compressible. Uh, and yeah, so because it's the default output, uh, you can do pretty convenient things from a command line perspective. So for example, if I said I want a table of all the records in the connection log, uh, that have a, you know, more than a certain amount of bytes and uh, I want to aggregate them by responding port and sort it with the, the big guys on top. Okay, so that's, that's all one big ZQL, ZQL command line all in one. But uh, just because Zing is the way it is and that's how ZQ uses it, I could have just as easily split this up where I say, okay, here's one ZQL just to give me the, isolate the events, count them, and then I'm going to use a separate ZQL to, or a separate ZQ uh, invocation to actually sort it, I would get the same results. And likewise, if I did it in three steps, if I said, just give me the, isolate the events, count them, sort them, same thing, right? So this is, uh, is going to come in handy when we get on to some of the other stuff later in the presentation uh, where we piece together, um, piece together CQ command lines in interesting ways. So with that, uh, let me jump back into our presentation. And uh, Steve, if you're uh, available, I'd like just uh, maybe give you a chance to talk a little bit more about uh, you know, what's so cool about Zeng. Yeah, I'm happy to talk a little bit about Zeng. And this has been kind of an organic project. Um, so all the stuff that Phil has been showing you, we've been tinkering with different ideas um, for a couple of years now, and we finally got around to like figuring out what we wanted to build and open sourcing and all of that. And during that time frame, we were using like the native TSV format for Zeek, which we came to know and love because it it, it had the schemas at the top of each um, log file. Um, you know, it wasn't in JSON that throws all that stuff away. Then everything's a string, so we could treat things using the 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 very nice type system that the Zeek team came up with in Vern back in the day. Um, which turned out to be pretty modern um, and pretty ahead of its time for, for mid nineties. Um, but anyway, um, we would run into little problems here and there. Like what is, what happens here? What happens there? Or like, what's the difference between an unset set and an empty set and then this and that. And, and a lot of that was well thought out, but, but we kept running into little problems. And then we were also concerned about performance. And so, um, I chatted with the guys, Vern and Robin and Seth and, and others at, at Seek Week class in Seattle last fall and just like floated the ideas like, shouldn't we make a spec for the Zeek format? And it was kind of like, yeah, that makes sense. So I started to work on it and it just kind of had a life of its own. And um, I, I then kind of asked myself, isn't there already a format out there that could like embody everything that we need, um, embedded schemas, uh, heterogeneous records from different log types put into one file, uh, efficient scanning. And the more I looked, the more I realized the answer was no. And it was kind of like, really, the world needs an, another format, but that's what we were concluding. And what we realized is there's these two worlds. There's kind of the world of logs and JSON, and it's all kind of messy and, Typing is hard and there's all these like different approaches to schemas that you have to configure and manage. And then there's the world of like the data lakes and um, OLAP and everything, everything has to fit into a schema. And you know, a, a data lake with Parquet where you have very wide schemas. And if somebody changes a Zeek script, then you need to go change the schema and the data lake because the, Zeek, the new Zeek script added a field, which is a column in the Parquet file that hadn't been anticipated in it. And that's kind of a mess too. And, and we realized the, I, the world, you know, maybe could benefit from the blend of these two worlds where you have the performance of like Avro or Parquet or Protobufs where it was very efficient. It was like machine encoding. Um, 
But the problem with those formats is they all assume kind of a uniform schema. It couldn't, it was kind of rigid in terms of the schema. It couldn't really handle this idea. Like JSON is just whatever I put in the object is its schema. And so Zing tries to, to sort of walk the, the tightrope or, or blend and balance those two worlds with something that's very efficient. It can be scanned very fast. Um, when the inner loop of ZQ doesn't have to deserialize all the data, it just, it just deserializes the values it cares about. Um, and then the schemas or the types are all embedded inside the, the, the Zing stream so that there's no need like with Avro um, and some of the protobufs and these other systems to, to specify the schema outside the scope of the stream itself. Um, and, and that kind of builds on the, on the history of, of the Zeek TSB idea of putting the schemas at the top of the file. Um, so we did the work, we put it all together. It's still, um, we haven't declared the spec final, um, but it's pretty far along and ZQ implements all of it. And we're playing around with um, some interesting organizations that have big data lakes that are very intrigued by using Zing um, to solve some of the data lake problems. And then we think it's like a better way to represent data for log search and analytics as well. Um, with that, I don't want to bore you to death. I'm happy to like chat with you more on our public Slack channel about Zing if any of you have more questions about it um, and want to talk about it and find out more about it. And it's all documented and it's all implemented in our open source ZQ repo. Great. Thank you, Steve. Okay, with that, uh, yeah, let's leave the world of the command line and let's, let's talk about the Brim app and where this all comes together visually. Uh, so yeah, so we, we took what we had done with ZQ and uh, what's, what's happened is it's been demonized into this thing called ZQD, a sort of quiet uh, thing that's sit, sitting behind this new app. And it's providing the, you know, the query engine that we were, the same thing we were doing at the command line with ZQ, same as equal language. And then, yeah, we built this app in Electron. So uh, it's the same framework as Slack. It, it also uses uh, React, for those of you who are JavaScript folks. And uh, yeah, it has all the, the cool features you expect from an app like that. It can auto-update, at least on Mac and Windows, which both support auto-updates uh, in Electron right now. Um, and uh, yeah, the, and the initial release, um, as I mentioned earlier, largely focused on this Wireshark-centric use case, although um, we've gone beyond that into you know, much more sort of Zeke-centric stuff as well. Uh, but we'll, we'll walk through that. Uh, and yeah, really part of what we were doing there was, um, you know, Wireshark, um, you know, Wireshark has this large community of, uh, you know, millions of, of users. And, uh, and, and what we found was that, you know, okay, if we want to bring the goodness of Zeke to, to this, you know, big community, uh, uh, you know, by by solving a compelling problem around packet capture was a great way to uh, to get a lot of a lot of attention. So, uh, you know, as as you've those of you who've worked with uh, with PCAPs uh, know this experience, where if you try to open uh, or, or or filter a large PCAP with Wireshark or TCP dump or whatever, you have to you know sequentially make your way through it. And uh, so, if you take increasing size PCAPs, it could take you tens of minutes potentially uh, to, to open it. And then every time you want to filter it, you have to walk through it again. And so, uh, yeah, one of the first things we did was, uh, was address that problem with a, a Zeekish approach um, in our initial version of the app that we released in the March timeframe. So let me, oops, let me bring up the app here. Bring up the app. Okay, so there, there is the Brim app. And uh, let's say, for instance, we start with a packet capture. This guy here, for instance, is uh, you know four four gigs. And so, if I went to open that in Wireshark, um, I see Gerald Combs is actually on the call with us. Hi, Gerald. Uh, this is not in any way a knock on Gerald because Wireshark is the coolest. But uh, we know that it will take some time to open a four gig uh, packet capture, right? As this thermometer slowly builds, this will take me five to ten minutes. Uh, so that's that's unfortunate. Uh, so what Brim was seeking to do in its first release to help you out with was, okay, let me just instead drag that packet capture into, uh, into the Brim app. And so right out of the gate, a couple things are happening. One is that we run some uh, uh, packet indexing tools uh, that are provided by the, the ZQ tooling. And uh, those tools, pardon me. Uh, so those tools are taking the, the 
the time data in the packet capture and creating the, uh, the time span across which uh, all the data is you can find in the packet capture. And then it also is starting to run your packet data through Zeek, right? Because you know that uh, Zeek can, can process packet captures. And, uh, and so you immediately within seconds of starting, you're offered the chance to, to begin uh, looking at Zeek logs that are generated from that packet capture, even while it's still loading. So for instance, if I search for Mozilla, uh, I will find all the, the Zeek events that have some reference to Mozilla in them. And then if I click on such an event, uh, the first thing that comes up is a little packet link. And that, when I click on it, we'll use that packet index that we generated to pull out the flow that's associated with that Zeek event from the underlying packet capture. And as you saw, it only took a couple of seconds. And the reason why that's possible, if we just kind of peek ahead, uh, when we, we have our right side log detail view that shows you all the details of the, of the Zeek event that you're looking at. And so, as you know from your Zeek data, every event has this uh, UID field. And so what the Zeek uh, app is able to do is join together the UID of the HTTP event that I'm looking on with its underlying connection record. And so the five tuple information, the IP and port information, the timestamp, the duration from the Zeek event gives me everything I would need to look inside of our packet index and say, hey, give me that just chunk of data from the, from the PCAP that covers that flow. And so, yeah, bringing that, that time to access flows uh, you know, down from minutes to seconds was a, was a pretty uh, cool thing that a lot of the Wireshark community responded to when we, when we first released. But uh, it being Zeek data, uh, you, know, you guys uh, know that there's a whole lot more to do with Zeek than just uh, get, get packet captures. So um, you know, we already looked at, at Zeek will uh, a fair amount from the command line. And so I won't go through all that stuff again, but um, you know, here in this search bar, I can do all the same stuff that we were doing there. So for instance, if I type a search term, right, it filters them down. Uh, we've put a lot of features in the app to try to make it easy to learn the SQL language and use it, uh, even if people don't necessarily have it all memorized. For instance, this thumbtack here, if I type a search term and I want it to be the basis of a bunch of things that I'm gonna do, I can just click it and now it becomes the basis of additional searches. So if I say, I wanna look at just HTTP path events from Zeek, uh, it will uh, apply the Boolean and those tool to as if I had typed them together, like we did at, uh, the ZQ command line. And I can keep pinning if I want to, and do additional searches like gets or posts if I want to look for HTTP methods. And let me open up along the left-hand side here. While I've been typing away, it's actually been keeping track of everything I've typed such that if I wanted to go back to a previous search, I can just click on it and it brings it back up and executes it. Uh, that's a time-ordered list. It also has a tree-ordered view, which uses the pinning of the things that I've uh, clicked on to construct a tree. And uh, yeah, if I'm, if I'm looking at, let's say this, this post one, and I change one of the search terms, it gives me a whole new branch in my history. So right now, this is just a, a log, if you will. We've uh, had discussions with the users about possibly allowing folks to annotate these or, you know, when we, right now, this is all just a single user desktop application. But if uh, we introduce the concept of, you know, multiple users converging on the same environment, uh, you could potentially want to share them, uh, archive them, things like that. All right, so let's keep moving, keep moving. Okay, uh, let's say for instance, I'm looking at these HTTP events. Uh, more things to click on in the app to learn, learn what's possible. If I right click on a value, such as this uh, responding port column, there's a count by option, right? So if a user wants to learn how to do aggregations, you just click on it and it actually appends the syntactically correct SQL to create a table for me here. And likewise, much like in Excel or Google Sheets, if I click on a column, right, it also appends the SQL to sort it. So now I have a table of results. And since it's HTTP, you're not surprised to see port 80s and 8080s. And they're like, oh, what's this rascal with the 2869, right? That's an unusual HTTP port. Well, we have a, an option right here. If you right click and say pivot, it's gonna rewrite my whole SQL command line to isolate just the events that we were looking at in that row. So now I've got a whole bunch of these port 2869s. And of course I can click on any one of them and get my packet link available, bring it up in Wireshark within seconds. And yeah, there it is, 2869, 
follow. Yeah, that's HTTP, all right, yeah. So you guys being Zeek heads, right, you can probably guess things like you could have a final time looking at weird logs if you want to count by, count by their categories, by their names, right? You could just have a, a lot of fun here saying like, okay, uh, oh my goodness, I have a sin after close. Do I have a you know, misbehaving uh, client or server in my environment? Well, let's take a look at it. Let's, uh, let's pivot to the packets. Is this for real? It's like, all right, yeah, you got a fin followed by a sin, you know, like, yeah, it's really happening. So uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff you can unlock in your Zeek data if you know how to, know how to get at it. So we've had a lot of fun uh, playing with that. Uh, I showed you guys earlier this log details view. Um, so yeah, this is a way you can kind of get that top down look at uh, all the fields that make up Zeek events. And so if I do a search for some known interesting data, this is some test data that Coralite shared with us and thank them for that. Uh, come on now. Oh. My business, my business, doc. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so now I have uh, some events that match that search term. And so, uh, yeah, as I click on different events, it will populate them here on the right. Um, I showed you guys earlier this correlation view. So you know, even though I've clicked on an HTTP event, uh, and that's highlighted in a little dotted line here, you can see through this UID visualization, okay, what's the underlying connection over which that happened? What are other events that happened on inside of that connection? What are the file payloads that, uh, that were transferred over those transactions? So yeah, with a single click, you can pivot to any of those other events. Uh, another couple other gifts we've given you from the Zeek world, uh, the documentation that Zeek provides on all the different fields, you can just tool tip hover uh, to look at them. So that's a convenience. And uh, we've also taken the history field uh, with all of its compact letter-based representation of a connection's lifecycle and turned that into a visualization. And for files in particular, uh, since uh, file hashing is going on in the background. Uh, whenever we see such a, when you, when you click on such a, a file in the details view, it does a correlation of its own to say, okay, are there times that we've seen the same hash uh, under differing file names? And of course, from here, you can now uh, quickly look it up in virus total. If, oops, went to my other window. Uh, yeah, so if you, if you take a hash and you wanna take a closer look at it, if it's naughty, or if you wanna see if one of these transmitting hosts is uh, worth looking at from the domain perspective. You can do a who is lookup right for the, in the app. All right, I'm burning through a lot of stuff. So if folks have questions, just let me know. Uh, yeah, finally, oh, time controls. Um, as I mentioned, the packet index forms the, the, the basis for uh, what, what is shown as the, the endpoints of here. Uh, but if I rush on the histogram, I can zoom in. Um, I can look closer at any given period of time. And uh, while we're not doing this sort of grand unified inverted you know, index, uh, like a lot of log search tools, uh, even in this desktop scale, we do have some time-based indexing. So if I'm, if I'm zoomed into a subset of time, like I've done here, and I, uh, let's say, uh, you know, do a count by, uh, it's, going to, it's going to isolate the, the, what it has to read from disk to only that portion of the uh, stored data that represents that period of time. So it does do some things to try to be very efficient about how much it has to read. Uh, and then finally, in terms of going back a little bit to the sort of how the sausage is made, um, this is a look at the, the directory. Ugh, can't type. <laughs> One more time, Phil. Okay, this is the directory where uh, the, the application is storing all of its data. And what it's actually done, in addition to the packet index I mentioned, um, it took all the, the Zeek logs that it generated based off the packet capture and put it into this single Zing file. So if we look inside of it, right, we see the same kind of Zing data we were seeing earlier where you've got, uh, you've got schemas and records. Uh, yeah, so you could even play with this uh, right from the command line if you wanted to uh, as well. So that is a quick tour of Brim. Let me bring back my slides. Uh, yeah, so in terms of... a uh, something that had to happen here when we released this first version of, of Brim uh, was the, the Windows problem. So Zeek is not officially supported on Windows. I'm, I mean, we know you can, you know, 
you could run a Linux VM on your Windows box. You could uh, use the Windows, uh, the Linux subsystem uh, for Windows. But uh, in terms of just a seamless experience, if we wanted to bring that to all these millions of Wireshark users, we felt like we would need to do something to cover them. So we took a shot at porting. Uh, and those of you who are developers and have ever tried to take like a Linux -y, Unix -y project and port it to Windows, uh, you know, Sigwin provides a nice way to get at a lot of the familiar tooling for development. And we got it working. Uh, however, Sigwin is not the fastest thing in the world. So in the first releases, uh, the Windows processing of packet captures into Zeek logs was much slower than we wanted it to be. Uh, so we uh, more recently, just in the past uh, week, actually, we, we released a new version that the Windows port is based on MinGW, the minimal GNU environment for Windows. And so that's about almost five times faster on packet captures we tested with uh, than, the, than the original Windows port of Zeek that we did. And uh, yeah, so it's been, it's been quite an educational experience. And we are starting the process of submitting the changes upstream to the Zeek projects. So uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, check out this issue. A few of the things we've done have already been merged uh, and there's more to come. So we're hoping that one day we will, right now we have our own Zeek port in the, our Brimsec GitHub repo, Brimsec slash Zeek, uh, where you can see all the changes. But uh, we're hoping that one day we'll be able to run a GA version of Zeek that just happens to also compile on Windows. And thanks to Gerald Combs for <laughs> bringing us Wireshark. All right, a uh, few more things to quickly touch on. Um, uh, we, in the more, you know, since that first version that was very PCAP centric, other things we've done, uh, we have Linux versions now, if you guys uh, didn't hear about that, we've got them for both uh, you know, your sort of Ubuntu Debian flavors as well as Red Hat flavors. You can also um, import Zeek logs directly. In fact, let me quickly just show that off. Um, so yeah, if, if you have a new, let's say I open a new tab, we do have tabs, of course. Uh, if you open a new tab and you have a few Zeek logs like I have here on my desktop, you can just drag those right in and uh, right away you've got your, you've got your Zeek log. So uh, you know, count by path and go to town. Uh, so I know we're, we're already past 42 minutes. So I don't want to, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll uh, keep, keep short on some of this. So right now the easiest way to do Zeek log ingest is if it's tab separated value, because it has all that field and uh, data typing information uh, as we mentioned. Uh, right at the top of your Zeek logs. However, we do have the ability to, uh, we do have the ability to import uh, JSON format logs as well. And what we've done to enable that is we've created a, a Zeek script. This, uh, it's called print, uh, print types.zeek, which uh, J, uh, John Sewick from the Zeek community helped us uh, create actually. And what that, um, what that script does is it's able to run against your, your Zeek environment, which might be you know, customized or just newer than the one we ship with. And it will create uh, a large piece of JSON that has all the field names and data types that your environment could emit. So this way, if you're using like the JSON streaming logs uh, output and you're outputting these JSON events that have lost all the data typing, you can then uh, apply that, uh, the output of that script as a, a piece of configuration with BRIM or, or ZQ to restore the data typing. So that way, for instance, an IP address that looks like a string in JSON can be treated as an IP address uh, once it's been reread back into ZQ. Uh, we also have the ability, you can export your results uh, from the app. So for instance, if I uh, took this uh, table, for instance, and I said, hey, I wanna export this uh, and I wanna put it on my desktop So now I have a file called results.zing. And so I could send it to a friend and they could import it back in. And now they have the same table uh, as, as Zing data. And uh, finally, oh, go ahead. We have a question. Yeah. We have a question. It's a very interesting question, probably for big debate and Steve is here. So Sheldon is, is asking, <clears throat> how can we use CQ and benefit or enrich Elastic? Um, he's saying that the benefits of CQL in Kibana would be sick. Um, so just thinking out loud, it's, mm -hmm. it's for a discussion. Maybe, maybe we, can, we can bring this into our public Slack um, and have the opportunity to, to have more thoughts there. Yeah, that's a good thought. Yeah, I mean, we, we do have a, a, a public Slack. I'll, I'll 
touch on it at the end, you know, from our, our website, brimsecurity.com, there's a little link at the top, a little Slack icon. Uh, yeah, we encourage folks to come there. And um, if there's topics that are a little longer than we can talk about today, we'd love to engage with you. I mean, off the top, I can say that, you know, Elasticsearch, obviously it loves JSON. Um, and so just like you could put JSON in, you can get JSON out. So I, I think technically it would be feasible for us to do something to, to get your JSON data back out and, and put it into a, a form that, that you can work with in, in Brim. But uh, yeah, let's talk together about, about details on that. Yeah. All right, and then a final thing uh, we just delivered recently is this concept of, of uh, uh, working with a custom Zeek. So some folks early on said, hey, I wanna you know, use Brim to uh, debug my Zeek scripts uh, or I have a highly customized Zeek. Um, so instead of just using the version of Zeek that we embed with the tool, uh, you can actually point at uh, your local Zeek. And so when we process PCAPs, we will use that instead of the one that's bundled. Uh, and I, I, these are hyperlinks. So assuming this, um, this, we'll put these slides up somewhere uh, with Amber's help. Um, these are links to our wiki. So in the brimsec slash brim repo, there's a wiki and these are articles that talk about how to actually use those features. Okay, so in the time we have left, uh, I'd love to be able to talk about something new we're doing, you know, with this tools-based approach. Uh, you know, so what, what comes next, right? So what comes after desktop scale? You've done everything you can with the, you know, let's say a few hundred megabytes or of, of logs you can cram on your desktop. Uh, well, we've talked to, actually, let me bring my speaker notes back here. Pardon me. Uh, sorry about that. Speaker notes and screen. Yeah, so we've talked to some users uh, who keep this sort of, we call it, you know, like a long tail of archived Zeek logs. And those could be sitting on filers or in S3 buckets. And uh, a lot of these users are not indexing all of it with their log search platform just for cost reasons or operational reasons, or, or maybe they don't have a log search platform. Maybe they're just using, you know, grep or, or, or you know, variations of grep on steroids uh, to, try to, to try to search that stuff. And so what we've started to do is create a, a, a prototype set of tools for searching and analyzing this kind of long tail of a, a, an archive of logs such as, such as Zeek. And, and the approach is pretty, a pretty simple extension of what we're doing. You know, right now this CQD daemon that in your desktop experience is, you know, you're really connecting to it over localhost from the application, but that means that it's technically feasible to connect to such a thing remotely. And so what we've done is start to enhance the ZQ environment to be able to, to, to work with these archives. And now uh, once we've got that working in the command line, we're gonna allow the app to connect to those uh, remotely and start working with them uh, over the network. And so what I'll do is I'll show off some of the, the ZQ command line tools for this archiving stuff, uh, kind of show you how the sausage is made. And I'll, I'll you know, say up front, the target audience for this is those who are interested in indexing implementations or that are familiar with big data concepts. Uh, you know, it, it's not yet pretty UI stuff, but that's, uh, that's all coming. So, um, and I'm sure I'll get Steve's help to, to jump in and keep me honest if I, uh, if I uh, misrepresent anything or leave out important details. So. Let me jump into Czar. Pardon me, I have to find my notes on Czar. Okay, so ZQ sample data. So here I've got a directory full of, they happen to be Zing format logs. They could also be Zeek or, you know, NDJSON with with data typing potentially. Uh, and so if I start out with that data, um, let's say I wanted to start treating it like an archive. Well, I've set an environment variable um, called czar root, which is gonna be the root of where I'm gonna keep my archive. And so right now it's, it's empty. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is just sort of import it into my archive. And so I'm gonna use the ZQ command and just say, hey, show me all the, uh, all the data in that directory, turn it into Z, make sure it's in Zing format, and we're going to use this new czar, uh, you know, Zing archive, uh, czar command to import it in 25 megabyte chunks. And so it's gonna put those chunks into my archive root. And I'll take a few seconds. And so once that's there, when I type czar ls, what it's gonna show me is, well, what's in the archive? And what's in the archive, if I look in the just direct tree command, 
you've got the 25 approximately, 25 megabyte chunks that we asked to make. And then adjacent to each one of them is a directory, which is right now is empty, which is a czar directory. And uh, that's where we're gonna start to put information to help me work with this archive. Before we start populating it, let's just kind of get the, get the feel for it by working with the archive uh, just with base ZQ concepts. So if I say czar ZQ, it's gonna basically execute these ZQL queries across the archive of what's in the czar root. So in this case, I'll take a simple thing like just counting. I just wanna count events. And this underscore is taking the place of each one of the zing files it finds in the archive. So when I ask for a czar ZQ count and say to put its output in this counts.zing file, what's in there is just simply a count of events in each one of those chunks, right? So uh, pretty simple. Uh, now, of course, you know, we talked earlier about how much we like pipelines. You could also just take that count and pipe it to another ZQ and say, hey, give me a sum, you know, add up all those events. And you get the same result as if you had said, hey, I want to count the original data. Same number. Okay, so that's, that's just brute force kind of right now working on the, on the uh, archive. Same kind of thing you can do with searches. If I wanted to say, hey, Zar ZQ, show me uh, all the records that have this as an originating IP brute force through all the archive. Yeah, we found, we found such an event. All right, so that's brute force. Now let's introduce some indexing, right? So uh, really where we're gonna go with this is ways to selectively start indexing this data to make accessing it faster. And the czar index command is how we do that. So when I say czar index, I can name, in this case, a, a data type like IP. So we're going to now create indexes for all the IP type fields that we find in the archive. And so when I run my czar ls command, we can see now in each one of these directories, we have a, Z, uh, a, Zing, uh, yeah, a Zing index of the IP type. And if you look inside one of those files, what you'll find is they're just yet more Zing files. So if I say, hey, let me look inside of this guy in text Zing output format. What you've got in there is you've got a header that defines that it is an index. It has a reference to which is the key field. And then now you've just got a sorted list of those keys. And these are all the IP values that appeared in that particular adjacent chunk. And so with the benefit of that, I can say czar find. So now I'm gonna leverage the index by saying for IP type values of that, uh, of that value I show, what are the chunks that have it and now you get it. And so obviously that's much faster than if I had had to brute force search the entire thing. So this is what we call micro indexes uh, because they sit right next to the original data and they're small. And indeed you can see, you know, next to this 25 megabyte uh, file, you have a 25 kilobyte file that represents the index. And so you can index by type like we did. You can also index by field name. So here I've got an index based on the URI field. And once I've done that, uh, I now have those are present and I can leverage it by finding, and it'll tell me which, file, which uh, chunks have reference to the URI field with the contents of slash file. And you can do even more cool things by, by virtue of them being, uh, by, by the virtue of them being Zing files, you can actually operate on them directly to do things like start storing aggregations in them. So for instance, here I will create a custom, you know, we call it like a custom index. And so what I'm gonna do is take a count uh, by, you know, Zeek path type and originating IP. I'm going to define that the IP should be a key And so once I create the index, we now have that next to, next to all the other things we've been, the other micro indexes we've been making. And so if you look inside of one of them, you've got that aggregation table, just as we just, as we asked for, right? And you've got the keys right where you need them with the counts by path that you asked for. And so now you can start to access it directly by saying, okay, I wanna look at the custom index and I wanna find the tables for a particular IP using czar find. 
and boom, now you've got like a whole bunch of little mini tables just based on that micro index. And much like we showed earlier with ZQ, where you can take the output, any Zing data can be output to another ZQ command. So if I want to actually start summing up those tables, I can get a summary table all at once. And that took me, you know, just under three hundredths of a second to, to compute, which is much, much faster than if I had to take all the original data and brute force it, right? That's gonna take me about three or four seconds because I had to go through all the records every time. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the quick summary uh, of what we're trying to do there. Where we're headed with it next is to take those concepts and bring it into the app eventually. These are just uh, sketches. And so by helping you out with making, making you aware through the, the interface, what is the stuff you've indexed? Uh, and such that if you start typing search terms, as long as you're, you're looking for things that we know are in the index, we'll be able to uh, guide you towards fast results to get to those chunks. And then once you've isolated them, you'll be able to start doing uh, fast searches based on them in this desktop scale environment. And if you happen to reference stuff that's not indexed, well, then the app would be able to uh, give you options to, hey, I want to actually index this additionally so it can start going fast, or you could just take the hit of a slower search um, where you can only, uh, where you'd have to still scan stuff to get all the data. So I just talked a lot there. Uh, Steve, do you have anything you want to add uh, about the czar world? Um, not really. I, we're coming up on the hour, but I think you did a good job kind of presenting that overall thing. I, maybe I'll just add that if this differs than, than the other approaches to like log search and analytics, where we actually think for like really big archives where it's almost tied to like a data lake experience in addition to like your log search through your, through your app. The idea is to open it all up. You could run the tools and uh, do like almost spark-like map reduce type of stuff on your data lake with all the logs represented in Zing. But you can also have, you know, the, the, the Brim app experience as well. And the idea here is that by by exposing the long tail archive with different UX, we think it might be a better experience in general, as opposed to um, trying to make the long tail archive problem and the kind of the live hot problem all work the same way through one UI. And so that's kind of the path, path we're on here. Great. Okay. Well, uh, that brings us pretty much to the end of the hour. Um, just to review, um, if you go to our website at brimsecurity.com, you will find links to lots of goodness. Uh, we mentioned we have a, a Slack, a public Slack you can join for questions, bug reports, et cetera, or just to chat with us. There's a link, uh, all, all the good links are in the upper right hand corner uh, for Slack. There's a 20 minute YouTube video that walks through a lot of the desktop features that I showed uh, and uh, links to where you can download stuff. Uh, these are the, the, the repos, the Brim and ZQ repos, uh, some key stuff there. There's a wiki on the Brim one, a GitHub wiki that has articles on that stuff. Like if you're doing JSON ingest uh, or you want to do the custom bring your own Zeek, uh, there's details there. Um, the SQL language docs are inside of the ZQ repo. So look for those as well as this, uh, the readme for czar. So if you want to run through that prototype, there's a little more there than I showed. Uh, if you want to go through that at your own time, um, we encourage you to do so and come find us on Slack if you have feedback or questions or you want to try using it in your environment. And if you want to check out the, the Zeek port that we did that includes the Windows stuff, that's in our own little fork repo here. This is the 951 is the, the Zeek issue for the Windows upstreaming if you're tracking that. And uh, this is the, the script uh, for generating JSON typing schemas if you uh, need to do that. Um, that's also available. And finally, I'll just say, yeah, we, uh, we are all open source. We are not uh, selling you anything, but uh, we do accept GitHub stars. So uh, if you want to put a star for us on the Brim and ZQ repos, we will uh, be forever uh, grateful. And with that, we had some questions along the way, but uh, Amber said we could run over if we need to. So if anyone else has questions, please do speak up. And uh, in the meantime, just I want to say thank you to Amber and the rest of the community for hosting us. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for being part of the series and, and we look forward to having you back and we will publish this um, on the Zeke blog. Um, but in the meantime, go over to the repo, give the, the Brim folks some stars. And if there's any other questions, please feel free 
uh, to add, we'll keep the recording going for, or ask, we'll keep the recording going for a little while longer. Okay, thanks. Um, Phil, I did, I did have a question. Um, earlier today on Twitter, um, as you mentioned the CTF or early on, um, we did have some folks saying this would have been great for the CTF this week. Um, we are having a community one that'll be coming up uh, on the 10th of this month. We'll put it out later today and, and blast it everywhere tomorrow. Um, is it all right if I put you in touch with the folks that, that write those uh, events and uh, incorporate uh, brim into the CTFs? Uh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I, well, we've already, I think we've got the ball rolling on that. Uh, okay. We've talked, you know, uh, we, uh, Steve Smoot uh, over at Coralite is a yep. friend from Riverbed Days, and uh, Javier and, and McCann, Steve McCann and I all know him well. Uh, and I guess Aaron Soto, I think, yep. yeah, so he, we've, we've, we've talked to Aaron, Aaron's seen uh, Brim, I'm sure he's just a busy guy, uh, but we've talked about getting us on the menu of options there. So uh, yeah, we're, we're all about it. If you want to draw Aaron's attention to the tweet and uh, as validation of the, of the, yeah, <laughs> validation of the demand, right? <laughs> so we'll, we'll accept that, but uh, yeah, we're, we're there to support the effort in whatever way is possible. Awesome, because we had talked about maybe trying to incorporate that in on, on the 10th, so, uh, and I talked to Aaron about it this morning, so uh, maybe, uh, maybe we can get that. Okay. Give it a little bit more energy, so just wanted to ask. Okay. I, I do see a, a question here from Terry. It uh, says, how far along was the server edition of Brim? And uh, that's an interesting way to phrase that question. Um, I guess, you know, this concept of being able to connect to a remote ZQD is sort of the, you know, the, the first step along that path. And we're, we're working on that right now to enable this archive, um, this archive use case. And so that'll certainly be coming up, I would say, in a matter of, well, within a month, probably. I, I'm not the development manager, so I don't want to put anyone on the spot. But um, yeah, so the ability to connect to a remote CQD is, is definitely coming fast. And then other features, you know, the archive comes first. Uh, there may be other things you'll be able to start doing with the remote, remotely connected uh, app. Um, so if you, you can have it on a server. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, since we've had a few minutes to chat, uh, and no one else has come up with questions. Maybe, uh, maybe it's time to go. Oh. Well, again, thank you all so much, and oh. uh, we'll get. Actually, Amber, we, we do oh. have one more question. Sorry. That's, that's, all right, go ahead. That's not, nothing like uh, threatening to end, right? Uh, so Eric <laughs> asked about the, the packet index. Um, actually, uh, Steve, if you're still available, um, Steve McCann, if you wouldn't mind talking up the packet index a little bit. Yeah, I'm happy to. So. <clears throat> Here's what happened. I was just going to use TCP slice or something like that that's existed forever. And then I realized TCP slice doesn't work for PCAP NG. TCP slice, by the way, is a program Vern wrote many, many, many years ago that used lib PCAP and it let you extract and play with big traces and pull little pieces out and all of that. And that's exactly what we needed. But it didn't work with PCAP NG. And I looked at, mm, do I want to fix TCP slice? And it was kind of old. And so, and we're, we're a go shop. So I thought, let's just make a little tool. So there's actually a tool in the repo. It's not really that well documented. The, the, the command line tool is documented. It's called PCAP, um, surprisingly. So if you go to the ZQ repo, repo, excuse me, and clone it and type make install, there will be a command called PCAP. And you can say PCAP help. And basically what it does is it just builds a little time index um, of all the seek offsets. And it, it, it basically allows you to, it, it's robust to like timestamps being out of order and all that sort of thing. So it lets you basically index into a PCAP file, uh, a time range, and then that it gives you back the seek offsets that you need to read. And then Go has this wonderful programming model where it was pretty easy to just, the code doesn't actually even parse the PCAP so much as it just takes those seek offsets and creates an image as a file as if it were the smaller file. Um, but you can play around with the PCAP tool if you're interested. That's how it works. Um, 
with this new czar indexing stuff that Phil has showed you, we actually could do more scalable indexing and we plan to do that. But right now it's just a simple time index that fits in memory. Great. Did that cover it well enough? Any follow up to that? Uh, no, we have thanks was the response. So cool. I think you're covered. Awesome. All right. Well, let's see, I, I interrupted Amber last time she tried to close up. So I'll, I'll give the floor back to Amber. <laughs> you can interrupt me anytime. It's quite all right. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll say thank you again. And uh, I look forward to getting this posted and shared and uh, revisiting the topic soon. All right. Thank you all so much. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thanks.